Hello, Run Elite. We are live right now. And okay, I'm trying uh, a new piece of technology here. So um, we're going to have some fun here. I've got my whiteboard set up behind me. And what we're going to be talking about here, and go ahead and say hello if you're on the live. Let me know where you're watching from. We're on Facebook and we're on YouTube right now. Uh, go ahead and say hello. And when we're done here, we'll have a chance uh, to go through any of the comments or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to jump into a training here for you that is going to be awesome. What we're talking about here today is when you try to get better as a runner, the way that I teach you is that there's basically a top-down approach. The first thing that limits you is your mindset. If you don't want to train harder, if you don't believe that you can do better, nothing matters. If you don't get yourself to get out the door, none of the training matters, right? So mindset first, but then running is a muscular event and a muscular event means that you can have the greatest heart and lungs, um, in the world, you know, you can have an engine, a tank that is just like superior, really high VO2 max, really high lactate threshold, really low resting heart rate, really powerful heart. You can have all of these things. Uh, hey, from Houston. Awesome. Um, so you can have the greatest aerobic engine, anaerobic engine to manufacture. And if you don't apply that energy that you're making to your muscles, none of it matters, right? So we have mindset at the top of this pyramid. And then what limits your performance beyond that? Hmm. It's your muscles. Running is a muscular event. If you don't train your muscles to contract for however long and however hard they need to contract to get your race time, you're not going to get the race time. So that aside, because we spend a lot of time talking about mindset and talking about training the muscles, but you do want to also train your metabolic systems, your heart, your lungs, your ability to manufacture energy. And that's what we're talking about here today. So we're going to go about 15 minutes or so. And um, we're actually going to be able to go probably pretty quick because I already have most of what I need to write. Uh, thanks for the thumbs up. Give me some love uh, in the comments. Give me some, uh, some hearts or thumbs up and tell me where you are. Um, uh, Gerardo, hey, welcome from... Honduras. Yes. International. Here we go. Uh, Michael, hello from New Jersey. It's good to see you on here. Thank you. Thank you for being part of Run Elite. So let's jump into this. Um, I'm going to get up to the whiteboard here, which means I'm going to switch cameras for you. And I'm going to warn you right now that what I'm going to tell you, you're going to like it at first, and then you might not like it because I'm going to tell you the truth about how to improve these things. And it's not Prob it's probably not what you're thinking. I'm not going to tell you train harder to improve these things. I'll tell you why. Um, Salty and Sprinkles from Houston. Hey, I'll be in Houston in uh, November on my way out to a hundred miler in Phoenix. Uh, cool. So, all right. Um, I will check back with the comments after we do the training, but let's jump up there now. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I want you to be able to see the whole screen. There we go. Uh, uh. Multiple cameras makes it a little bit difficult. All right. <clears throat> Hello from the whiteboard. So what we're going to be talking about here is the way that you make energy and the first thing I want you to understand is that you see this square here. This square basically just represents the mitochondria inside of your cell. So you've probably heard of the mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cell, meaning that it's where you make energy. So the mitochondria makes, I put just equals ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. You may have heard of this term before. You may have not. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, ATP is the form of energy in your body. There's nothing else in order to beat your heart, contract your muscles, breathe, replicate a cell, do anything. You need ATP, only ATP and nothing else. What about food and caffeine? Don't those give us energy? No, no, no. We just convert food into ATP. So understand that the mitochondria here, I put it in a big black square so that you can see that's the mitochondria. I'm not going to label it here for you for the sake of space. Just know that's the powerhouse of the cell. Now, what do we need to do in order to make energy for our running? Well, 
you need to convert some things outside of you, like food and oxygen, for example, and you can create energy. So the main input that you have in order to do that, that's outside of your body, the main one that you need is you need fuel. So fuel comes in the form of glucose. Now you can turn sugar, carbohydrate, protein, or fat. You can turn any of them into ATP. That's how important ATP is. Your body will turn anything that you put in, it'll turn it into energy, any of the macronutrients. But it doesn't mean that they're all equal. What our body really wants, what it really prefers is glucose. So glucose comes from plants. When you eat fruit or you eat a vegetable, uh, you're eating glucose and fructose at the same time. And it's mostly glucose. And we're going to use glucose in the mitochondria. In fact, the mitochondria really needs to, to have glucose. And we're actually going to break glucose down before it gets into the mitochondria. So this is a bit of a simplification. You're going to break a glucose down into two different pyruvate molecules, they're called. You don't need to know that. Just understand glucose, a form of sugar that comes from your food, you need to ingest that. So I have that circled in red because I want you to see that that's one of the inputs that you need. If you don't have glucose, you're not going to run. Now, if you don't ingest glucose because you're in a famine or because you're on a keto diet or whatever it is, if you don't have glucose, your body will turn fat or even protein into glucose and then enter into the Krebs cycle. So no matter what, your body will give you glucose. Understand that first. Okay, once you eat glucose, then it goes into the mitochondria. And we have this cycle here that's called the Krebs cycle. Now, I took out all of the steps of the Krebs cycle just to simplify this. But inside of the mitochondria, there's a process that goes on where you take that broken down glucose and you add NAD. You might have heard of NAD recently because it's in it's a lot in the popular culture with um, you know like Andrew Huberman and Peter Atia and with in longevity research and in performance research. So you've probably heard of uh, NAD before NAD plus. And what NAD does is it is a contributor in the Krebs cycle. So you're basically basically going to use NAD and then spit out some byproducts. You're going to use up NAD. Okay. But you need to do that in order to complete this cycle where you're going to spit out energy. So again, the whole purpose of your training to make you a better runner is, well, we condition the muscles, but then after that, we need to produce energy. You need to produce energy. If you're not producing energy, nothing you're doing matters. We need to increase our ability to do that. So you need to have appropriate fuel intake of glucose. You need to be able to make NAD plus in your body. And then finally, you're also going to need oxygen. Now oxygen, I put it kind of on the inside and outside of the mitochondria here because we need oxygen in order to basically um, to cut the molecules of sugar. But we're not going to go into that here today. You need oxygen. And as long as you're breathing, of course, you're going to get oxygen. You need NAD plus, which your body's going to make, and you need an input of fuel mostly through glucose, okay? Those are the three things you need. Now, if you have one, two, three, you're gonna make ATP and you're gonna be able to run and you're gonna be able to run faster because as you go faster, you need more and more ATP and you actually switch energy systems. You've probably heard of them before, like the aerobic energy system. And you use that when you're running nice and easy. And then we have the anaerobic energy system when you're going pretty fast for like a 400 or something. And then we've got the immediate energy system when you're sprinting all out for about eight seconds. And as you move forward into those more intense energy systems, you need more and more and more and more ATP. If you just had infinite ATP, just like injected into you, you would be able to basically sprint at full tilt forever until like your muscles broke down or something like that. Okay. So ATP is really what is going to limit you. Now, you understand now that you need to have these inputs, but you probably don't understand yet how to maximize these and enhance these. And that's where we're going to go from here. So the main thing you need to do is just not mess this up. Don't mess this up. Okay. Don't mess this up. Your body will breathe. As long as you're alive, you're breathing. As long as you're eating, you're getting glucose. And as long as you're healthy, essentially, you're going to be making NAD. You have lots of NAD, um, but at age 50, NAD goes off of a cliff. 
So we, we stop making as much NAD and we start demanding more NAD through our body processes. And so there's less to make energy. Okay. But here's how, so your body will do this. You don't need to do much, but you can get in the way. You sure can get in the way. Here's how we often get in the way. And we're going to go through five of them here. The first one is that you may have insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is really, really, really stinking important here. Um, I actually encourage you to just do a search on YouTube and listen to um, to insulin resist resistance. Listen to some long form podcast and get this into your psyche, into your knowledge base, because it's very important. But essentially, <clears throat> when you eat food and then the glucose gets out of your stomach and into your intestine and then it goes into your blood, you have glucose floating around in your blood and your body wants to get it out of the blood, grab it and pull it into the muscle so that you can use it for running, a running muscle. It doesn't do you any good in the blood. You have to put it into the muscle where you can use it. But there's a problem. As the blood sugar goes up, you need to secrete insulin in order to grab onto that sugar and pull it into the muscle. Now, if you are insulin resistant, you can't take that insulin and pull the glucose into the muscle cell where it can go into the mitochondria. You can't do it. So your blood sugar goes up and this is what causes diabetes, type two diabetes, right? This high blood sugar that happens. It happens from insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is going to impede this process by impeding what? Glucose. Glucose here. Insulin resistance will impede your ability to use glucose inside the cell. Now, I'm going to come back after we go through all five. We're going to come back and I'm going to tell you how to improve all five of these. And you actually improve them all the same way. So you're going to love this. Okay, number two is if you have high amounts of sugar. Now, not sugar from food, not sugar that's in a piece of naturally occurring food. Like if you eat an apple, there's glucose, there's fructose, it's sugar. But it's, there's no sugar. It's an apple. I'm talking about pure refined sugar. When you eat purely refined sugar, you damage the mitochondria. Here, this big box. So you can't make as much ATP. So sugar intake will damage the mitochondria. And what I'm circling here is just the mechanism by which these things impede your ability to make energy. Okay. I'm going to tell you how to avoid these when we get to the end here. Number three is your epigenome. So you have a gene expression, uh, and that is, you've heard of the genome, right? Your gene expression determines your eye color and uh, the length of your bones and uh, everything about you, basically. But you have a lot of genes, but only some of them are expressed. And you can change which genes are expressed through your lifestyle. But... Which genes, are, which genes are expressed will determine how much NAD you can make. So we have NAD as a limiter here. And your epigenome will determine your manufacturing of more or less mitochondria. So your, your gene expression is going to influence how much energy you can make. You can see that here. Okay, number four is dehydration. And this is chronic dehydration. So if you're dehydrated because you're running a race in the heat and you're sweating out a lot, well, that's a different story than if you're chronically dehydrated. Now, if you're chronically dehydrated, all of the solution that this happens in, your blood, the interstitial fluid, the, the water inside of your cell and outside of the cell, all of these things really matter. And if those are compromised if, because of low levels of hydration, you can't carry out this process. The enzymes are inhibited. You just, you're not as efficient. Um, so you, if you're dehydrated, you also can't make as much energy. And finally, number five, cancer. So for dehydration, I didn't put a mechanism because it's kind of like a global mechanism. Cancer, Rob, a cancer cell is very hungry for energy. So if you have cancer in your body, those cancer cells are going to rob the energy that you do make. And so you can have all of the great inputs that you need. You can breathe properly. You can have all the NAD possible and you make all this energy, but the cancer cells, they just steal it. And so you don't have that energy, the ATP in order to use it for running. 
now you have other problems as well, right? Because you're going to lose energy for uh, taking care of detoxification and cell replication and brain function and all those things. And that's why cancer can be such a killer for us, right? So the presence of cancer will rob you of ATP. Now, now you have an understanding of the three things that you need in order to make energy. And those are oxygen, input of fuel, predominantly glucose, and NAD. Now, you have five things that can mess it up, but here is the kicker. Are you ready? Let's go with red for this one here. How do you improve your insulin resistance? You do this through diet. Through diet. And the main way that you do this is through a low fat diet. In fact, in the lab, when you know uh, technicians are using mice or rats in order to study the effects of any number of things um, before doing human studies. When they want to test, for example, a diabe diabetes medicine, they need to make the rats diabetic in order to test the medicine. How do they make the rats diabetic? There's a protocol, and that protocol is to feed them a very high fat diet. So a high fat diet leads to insulin resistance, which means you can't use glucose to make ATP as well. So you're in bad shape. And the way that you improve this, um, this is for another video because it's a big topic, but a low fat diet, a low fat diet. How low? Well, check out Douglas Graham 801010. Go ahead and type that in. Take a note for it. Douglas Graham 801010. Um, you'll get a lot of information there, but low fat diet. Okay. Number two, sugar. Well, refined sugar we can avoid that, can't we? Just don't eat it. It can't. It doesn't mean you don't have sweet things. You can eat sweet fruit. You can fl uh, use date sugar. Date sugar is just a date that's been ground up and kind of dehydrated, and it's it's a form of sugar that's a whole food. So you can still have sweet food, but just don't use refined sugar in things. That also means white flour because white flour gets converted to sugar really quickly. But the point is, this is diet as well. Can you see that? Sugar, refined sugar, is clearly something you either ingest or you don't, so it's diet. How about your epigenome? Now, your epigenome is more complicated. In order to have an epigenome that allows you to produce more NAD and produce more mitochondria, what should you do? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of them right here. One of them is diet, of course, but you can do cold, cold immersion, like a cold plunge. And in my book, which is coming out in two weeks, um, you've got an entire chapter on there on how to use cold in two different ways to improve your epigenome and your performance instantaneously. You can also use heat. And this is uh, all the, the rage with the sauna use right now. Um, by using heat, you can basically improve your epigenome expression of these components here. You can also, and you should, sleep <laughs> Without proper sleep, you don't stand a chance, my friend. If you want to run better, if you want to be able to make more energy and run better, you have to sleep. It's where so many of the of vital processes in your body happen, including your epigenome expression is going to dramatically change with adequate sleep versus not adequate sleep. Okay? And then, that's probably the biggest one here, sleep. And then, of course, diet. What you eat is going to dramatically determine the genes which you express in your body. Okay, dehydration. This one is obviously diet as well because it's either taking in or not taking in high water content items. So I want to share with you here that dehydration probably is not best combated by drinking water because you don't have like water in your body. You have water mixed with electrolytes, mixed with minerals, mixed with nutrition. Uh, so when you consume water, the best way to stay hydrated is to eat foods that are high in water, like a fruit or vegetable, not a fried Oreo or a slab of dehydrated meat or really anything cooked. When you cook something, you take water out. There are some benefits to cooking, but there's a lot of downside to cooking as well. So I'm just telling you, if the goal is to be hydrated, eat only high water content foods. And then you actually don't need to drink as much. And you're getting water delivered with a whole package of other foods and electrolytes, and for example. Um, so 
hey, look, if you're, if you're dehydrated, go ahead and drink water, but really shift your diet away from dehydrated foods into hydrating foods and you'll be good. And then finally, cancer. This is a big one here. And because we're, we're public here, I'll save some of this for my private group. Um, you can read about some of this in my book as well, but cancer, we want to keep you alkaline. Now this is a big topic, so I'm not going to go deeply into it here today, but cancer the biggest determinant of whether you're going to get cancer or not is not your genes. Even if it were your genes, it's your epigenome expression. Are you going to express cancer or not? It's not your genome. It's not like it's predetermined, written into this, the gene. No, it's your lifestyle. And the biggest determinant here is going to be, guess what? Diet. Diet. If you want to alkalize and I will go a little bit deeper on this here just because um, I know the comments will blow up if I don't do this, but your body will not, you can't alkalize or acidify the inside of your body. Your body won't allow it to happen. You have to maintain a homeostasis. And so if you start to acidify a little bit, your body will alkalize your body for you. And it can do that a number of ways, like stealing calcium from a bone, for example. But if you never give your body a, a challenge to stay alkalized because you're acidifying it with your diet, if you don't do that, your body doesn't have to work so hard to keep you alkaline and you can maintain a soft tissue integrity. You can maintain bone density, things like that. So your diet is the biggest uh, contributor for the development of cancer. For the, it's one of the biggest for your chronic dehydration and your epigenome. Refined sugar is, of course, in your diet, and insulin resistance is caused by a high-fat diet. So what all these things have in common, my friend, is that uh, diet, 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 diet matters a lot for improving, for, for getting rid of the things which keep you from being able to make a lot of ATP. And we see this in older populations. Like I told you, after you age 50, NAD goes off of a cliff. So... If you want to maintain higher NAD later into life, you can take supplements. There's a, an entire science to this. Uh, you actually can't take NAD plus, but you can take precursors to NAD. Um, I recommend you don't don't even worry about the supplements. Just eat a proper diet, and your body will be able to make all of the NAD that it needs to. You're not going to have things in in your body like cancer, which will rob your body of ATP. And you just free up, free up, free up more and more, more and more and more ATP. Your ATP goes through the roof where it should be. We should have all the energy that we need, but we impede ourselves over a lifetime. So if you don't impede yourself, your ATP just stays really high and you're going to be able to manufacture more ATP. So you have high levels of readily available ATP. You can manufacture it at will. You can use it because you're not insulin resistant. You can grab uh, sugar, pull it into the muscle, create the ATP, and run. And you're going to run very well. So that is our training here today. I hope that you got something from this. I'm going to check in on comments for you here. And we can just hang out for a couple of minutes. So go ahead and uh, if you already put a comment, cool. <laughs> all right. I already see a couple of funny ones. Uh, all right. Salty says ATP Krebs cycle. Oh man. Back to microbiology. Yep. Yep. Now you don't need to know all of this. Okay. The take home point is eat a diet that is high in carbohydrate. Now carbohydrate doesn't, I'm not saying eat white flour, white sugar, bread, and pastries. People think that that's what a carbohydrate is. And I guess it is, sure, but that's a refined carbohydrate. Don't eat that either. Eat a carbohydrate in its natural form. A simple carbohydrate from fruits and vegetables or a complex carbohydrate from a starch, which would be rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, lentils, beans, any of those things. Um, so you don't even need to know any of this. It's just a fun way for us to engage on it. Um, I want to add in the chat that I called it Krebs cycle before you explained it. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. So, cause you remember from school, right? You were paying attention. 
Andrew Miller, hey, oh man, I've been on the fried Oreo diet. I had no idea. Oh, well, stop that. <laughs> I think you're kidding. But um, look, man, you got to live a little. It's up to you what you're going to eat. But I'll tell you, fried Oreos, they're going to let's see if we can uh, look behind me here. Insulin resistance. If you eat a bunch of Oreos high in fat fried, uh, it's going to contribute to insulin resistance. You also have refined sugar. Uh, it's also not optimal for your epigenome. It's also going to dehydrate you. And I don't know, I'm not going to go as far to say Oreos cause cancer, but they're probably not going to help. Okay. Uh, salty and sprinkle says Oreos are vegan. Yes, they are. It doesn't mean it's healthy. Vegan does not equal healthy. <laughs> High water content, plant-based, natural food. Well, that's a different story. Now, by default, that is a vegan. Okay. But vegan also is, um, you know, corn pops and Oreos and sweet, spicy chili Doritos. And like, these are vegan too, but they're not health promoting, of course. Uh, Andrew says, absolutely love what you do, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, cannot believe this channel hasn't blown up yet. You're such a knowledge, uh, and a approachable person. Thank you so much. Well, the channel is relatively new. I've had my business running elite for uh, many years now, but we only just started YouTube in the fall. So uh, make sure you like and comment, and it really does help the algorithm. Um, if there's a comment within 24 hours of a video being posted, um, it helps the algorithm. I'm not sure how it works with a live, but thank you so much. Stay tuned. We have a lot coming for you, especially once the book comes out. Um, August 15th, mark your calendars. I'm going to be sharing a lot with you here on the channel. Uh, a lot of bonuses from the book, um, some special offers. So stay tuned. I think it will blow up for sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate the support. Um, proper diet is so divided these days. Um, online, it sure seems like it. I work in cardiology. Half of my colleagues are vegetarians. Some are vegans. Some are going carnivore. And some believe balanced diet is the way. Okay. The research... Now, the bro science on diet is all over the place. So if you go to Google and you type in, what's the best diet? You're going to see all kinds of things. You're going to see testimonial from all kinds of people. But instead of just listening to what somebody says, we should look at the evidence-based peer-reviewed research. And you have to take it with a grain of salt because we also want to see where that research is funded. But when not funded by the dairy industry the meat industry, um, the research is conclusive on this. I highly recommend checking out a channel. I think it's the highest quality channel that there is on nutrition. It's called nutritionfacts.org. Um, I'll put it here for you. Nutrition facts, facts.org. Um, that is a website, but it's also a YouTube channel, nutritionfacts.org by Dr. Michael Greger. Now, Michael Greger has 200 doctors that work for him full-time, and all they do is they read every single article inside of every single issue of every nutritional periodical printed every year. They don't miss any. All of them, all of the journals, they read all of them every year. 200 doctors on staff. And he basically conglomerates all of this information and he's got several books, but he's got a YouTube channel that just has anything you can imagine on it. Um, go there and type in whatever you want to know. If you want to learn about keto diet, if you want to learn about vegan diet, if you want to learn about whatever, just go to his channel, type it in, and he's got dozens of videos. And they're not opinion. They're peer-reviewed evidence-based research only. Very well presented. I highly recommend it. Um, my friend is vegan. She eats French fries when we go out to eat. Not healthy. Absolutely. I can tell you that one of the biggest frustrations of being a vegan is what other people think you eat because it's wrong. Like, Now, maybe your friend really likes French fries, but probably I'm going to guess that she's sick and tired of going out to a restaurant where all she can eat is French fries and a salad. Hold the bacon, hold the dressing, hold the crouton, hold the whatever, hold the cheese. And it's just like some boring salad for 20 bucks. Um, this is not what most plant-based eaters choose to eat. It's just when we're out at a restaurant with friends that's not plant-based friendly, what are we going to eat? Either nothing or bring our own food, or if we want to participate, French fries are sometimes the only thing. So not healthy whatsoever. Um, I don't recommend eating oil, no oil, especially fried, no oil. So 
but it is plant-based. So uh, I, c I can appreciate where she's coming from. Um, oh, geez. I can't pronounce your name. Maybe I can. Let me try. Bulentin? Bulentin? Did I say your name right? I hope so. I agree. I learned so much from your videos as well. Thank you. You're welcome. I really hope I, can, I say your name right. I try to get people's names right, but um, that's my best shot at it. Uh, hold it all, please. Yeah. Hold it all, please. <laughs> hold it all. You're right. Um, hold the restaurant. You're not going to get healthy food at a restaurant. Sorry. If nothing else, it's going to be slathered in oil. So I don't often go to restaurants. When I do, um, there are, there's very few. And I live in a very like healthy city, Asheville, North Carolina, where there's lots of plant-based options. They're just all slathered in oil and fried with this and that. Nonsense. Um, but when you eat... So today, let me tell you what I ate today. Um, I drove out to this beautiful mountain that has this creek. I spent half the day out there. I brought an entire watermelon with me. I cut it in half after my run. And on the drive, I ate half of a watermelon. It's about 400 calories. Uh, then I had some lentils when I was out at the river. I had like a little container of lentils. Um, and I just made some sandwiches out of uh, bread. I don't often eat bread. I haven't bought bread in probably half a year. But and it was raw tomatoes, raw lettuce, raw onion, oil-free hummus, and uh, lentils, again, on top. And pickles. I got pickles. So just plants. Um, eat at home, you know? When we're done here, I'm going to go make some juice, some green juice. If you were to incorporate some type of meat into your diet, what would your suggestion be? Um, no meat. No, I can't suggest meat. It's not that a certain kind of meat is like better than another one. I mean, you could hit yourself in the head with a sledgehammer or with a splitting ax and it's like either one is going to hurt and be bad and probably kill you. So don't, you know, it, okay, if you're going to eat meat, look, I don't recommend eating meat for a number of reasons that go far beyond the scope of what we can teach in this video here. I'll do other trainings for you on this, but this is like such a topic where there's, there's such a, opinionated people that we really need to take one topic at a time and dissect it deeply. Uh, otherwise, I'm just I'm just asking for it, right? Um, but if you're going to eat meat, if you're going to, then you want to have it be least processed as possible. So on one end of the spectrum being like really bad, you could have fried bologna or like a hot dog or something. There's That's not even meat. It's like a meat byproduct byproduct remnants of something with chemicals and nonsense. Okay, don't do that. Um, if you were going to eat meat, which I don't recommend, but hey, if you're going to um, eat something that is like one thing, so one piece of meat, not like a conglomeration, that is processed minimally. And um, the only way to do that is to get it direct, uh, direct from a farm where you know it's not injected. Look, look, even salmon, for example, what color is a salmon? What color should the, the flesh of the salmon be? We think it should be pink. It's not supposed to be pink. It's white, but it's pink. We think it's pink because we've been conditioned to that, that we'll only buy pink salmon. And so there's coloring added to it. And by the way, the coloring often comes from beets. And when they do that, the health, prom the, the quality of the, of the salmon goes up because we added a plant to it. Isn't that interesting? Um, Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org. That's where I learned that. But um, you're not going to be able to trust what you're getting at the store. It may have hormones. It may have pus. It may have blood. It may be injected with saline, with water. With uh, They inject salt and water, try to blow things up, make them more. Don't do that. Get it direct from the farm. Minimally processed which means minimally cooked as well. But that's a slippery slope because you could die if you eat uncooked meat, which is interesting, right? So why are we eating it? If it could kill us eating it in its natural form with like worms and parasites and stuff, then isn't that interesting? Um, but I can't tell you which one to eat. It's not like salmon over pork, over beef, over chicken. Um, they're all going to have similar detrimental effects to you, but take the less processed over the more processed one any day of the week and you're going to be far better off for doing that. Okay, I hope that helped. Um, some types of meat into your diet. Okay, probably save a ton on money doing that. 
Uh, I'll tell you, people think it's expensive to eat healthy. It's not. The cheapest foods at the supermarket, what are they? Let's see, bananas. I eat mostly bananas. Um, over the course of a year, I'd say like 60% of all my calories are bananas. Um, I'll eat 10, sometimes 20 plus a day, but 10 a day. Um, bananas are the cheapest. Cabbage is like the cheapest food ever. Rice, potatoes. These are like the cheapest foods. Um, the only reason why meat and dairy are like relatively inexpensive is because they're subsidized by the government. If they weren't, they'd be very expensive. So plants are cheap, but if you, if you don't have any money to eat and you're just scrimping by on pennies, get, what would you get? Cabbage and bananas because they're the cheapest and they're packed with nutrition. They're basically free. Um, so you do save a ton of money. If you go out to eat, if you eat gourmet plant-based, it's very expensive. So don't do that if you want to save money. Um, beer juice and turmeric just made me think of that. Love that drink. Are you talking about beet juice? What is beer juice? I don't know what beer juice is. Let me know. If if that's beet juice, then it makes sense. <laughs> AJ says, I never was able to outrun a bad diet. I hear you. You're just being honest here. Thanks. I love sugar. I don't blame you. Before I read the rest of your comment, this is interesting. If you love sugar, what does that say? Your, it, it's, your body's not dumb. Your body wants sugar. It wants that sweet, sweet, sweet glucose. It wants that because that's what it needs. Your brain uses only glucose, nothing else. There's a little bit of a asterisk to that. It does use fructose, but only produced in the brain, not from your diet. So it only uses glucose. That's it. That's it. So of course you have a sweet tooth. We want sugar. We want glucose because our body needs it. So if we eat a diet that has a lot of fat and a lot of protein and a lot of nonsense in it, you can get to the end of, you can eat steak and fried cheese until your belly is out to here and you'll never eat another bite again until someone says apple pie and you go, yes, please. Or ice cream. Yes, please. Why? You're full. You're popping at the seams, but you can always stuff in some ice cream. Why is that? Because your body didn't get the glucose that it needs. And so it's starving for glucose. And even if you're full and bursting at the seams, you can, you'll still, you won't take in any more bacon. No, no, no. But you'll take in more sugar because that's what you need. That's why you crave sugar because you need it. But imagine that you only ate sugar in a whole form. Imagine that you ate an entire watermelon, a whole thing, a nice sweet watermelon, 10 juicy mangoes, you know, a 10 banana smoothie with the dates in it. Uh, it's like you, you're so satisfied that you don't want dessert. It is dessert. It's sweet. Fruit is a dessert. If you ate all fruit for your appetizer, your dinner, and your dessert, and your breakfast, and your lunch, and 10 days before, you're so satiated with sweetness that you don't crave that like sweet tooth anymore because because you should <laughs> crave sweet food is what i'm saying um fried food i love sugar yeah i love fried food it's very stimulating of course it is oil oil mixed with salt so like something that's fried and salted uh, like or even bread um or um i don't know you name it cheese which is like fat and salt, right? These things are super addictive. Uh, it, it's, that's all it is. It's a food addiction. What can I do to get my head straight to start eating right? You're running 60 to 65 miles per week. What can you do to get your head straight? Um, okay, bin, I'm going to type in a couple of resources for you. Just binge on information here. Here's a good place to start. Um, watch the documentary, The Game Changers. Then watch the documentary, forks over knives then go to the youtube channel uh jillian berry on youtube and binge everything that she has i recommend her because she's like the joe rogan in the health space meaning that she does long form interviews hundreds and hundreds of them high quality um She's a good interviewer. You can learn a lot there. But what do you do? You have to break the food addiction. 
And the best way to start breaking a food addiction is be easy on yourself. Don't take anything out. Just put in more of the good, in more of the good, in more of the good. Have a morning green juice and then have a, a giant smoothie for lunch and then drink before you have dinner, have an hour before, have, you know, 40 ounces of water or juice, fresh pressed juice, and then have a salad before you eat your dinner and then eat whatever you want for dinner. Don't deprive yourself because you'll go run into it. If you try to like deprive yourself, just put more of the good in more of the good in, more of the good in. And by the time you get to the things that aren't as good, you'll eat less of them. And that's a good step. And you do that for a week or a month or six months or six years. And eventually you'll start to just choose to eat more of the good and less of the bad, more of the good and less of the bad. And it can happen over time like that. That's one of the ways you can do it. Um, I'll tell you that the only foods that you'll find that aren't addictive, crazy addictive, the only ones that you'll find are raw foods. Once you cook anything, even a cooked potato with no salt, if you've been on a fully raw diet and then you have a cooked potato, your brain lights up like a crackhead, you know? Um, it sounds extreme. You probably wouldn't believe it unless you did a diet that was fully raw. If you did that for a while, if you started eating only raw fruits and vegetables, or if you did only raw juice, which is a good way to, to start to like cleanse. If you did 20 days of just juice, if you did that, <clears throat> you would notice intense psychologic cravings for foods that aren't, aren't even real foods. You'll, you'll remember that funnel cake you had when you were 10 years old and like this craving for it will just like come back. Clearly we're not designed to crave a funnel cake. <laughs> it's a manufactured thing. It's a psychologic addiction that'll come up and then you move through it and it goes away. And it's like, ah, I wasn't hungry. I wasn't famished for junk food. It was a psychologic craving, which is very real. And it's very difficult to move through. Um, I'd, Personally, I'd say it's the most addictive thing I've ever come across in my life is stimulating cooked seasoned food. So how do you break it? Um, you could do, if you really want to break it, you do a cleanse. You do a raw food only cleanse. And the best way to do that uh, is a juice cleanse. Watch Jillian Berry's channel because, or post questions for me in the comments here after, and I'll maybe do another video for you. Um, it's just a lot to talk about here. We'd be here all day. Okay, I'm breaking it in and feeling great. Awesome. Are you a teacher or a previous teacher? Um, I've taught several things in my life. I am a full-time running coach. <laughs> so I spend all day, every day doing deep dives, hour and a half deep dives with my clients and doing uh, Zoom calls kind of like this in this office here. Uh, so yes, I do. I've also taught, what else have I taught? Um, I've taught martial arts. That was a long time ago. Um, I'm not a teacher in school. No, I, no, I'm not a teacher in school. I thought of for a while of, of doing that. Um, AJ says, would you have a water bottle next to you? Would you have the water bottle next to you? I asked you what bottle you use for your orange mud hydration pack. I still, I can't read the rest of it. Um, I, oh, I answered you AJ in the comments today. It's just a bottle that I got from Dick Sporting Good. That's like 24 ounces. It's just insulated bottle. That's it. Would you have the water bottle next to you? I'm not sure what you're asking. What, I, what do you mean? Would I have it next to me? During a race? I don't, I don't really understand. Um, type it again. Can you show me the bottle you use during your ultra? I asked you a couple of times. Still can't th find the right bottle. Um, you want me to like show you? It's just a bottle. It's just a biker bottle. It just fits in like a bike rack. I just went to Dick Sporting Goods because all I had was like a 18 ounce bottle. I wanted a 24 ounce. So I went into Dick Sporting Goods. I got a 24 ounce bottle that like fits in a bike rack. That's it. Simple. Um, I don't feel like going to get it in my kitchen now because it's just a normal bottle. There's nothing special about it. I mean, just, you can get it at any sporting goods store. But if it only matters if you have that orange mud because it fits right in it, right? Heck, I'll send you one. Email me. Um, email me. Uh, you can email me at, or DM me actually. I don't want to put my email up here. Um, DM me at Run Elite Coach on Instagram. At Run Elite Coach on Instagram. DM me your address 
And I'll ask you to pay for shipping if you want, but I'll send you a free bottle. Uh, you think structured shoes are necessary uh, or train the muscles to work right? No, do not. Um, there's a great book that you could read called Tread Lightly. Tread Lightly. Get the book. Get the audio book. Read it. It's on the history of running shoes. I used to work for Ultra. These guys here. Ultra. Um, I learned a lot about shoes when I was working for Ultra. And uh, I'll tell you, that book I learned quite a bit. Um, no, there is a direct correlation with stability components in a shoe and injury risk, meaning that the more stability components you have, the higher the risk for injury. The only reason you want to have stability in a shoe is if you have an acute injury like tibialis posterior tendonitis. You might get some stability in there, support that tendon until it gets better and then take it away. You might if you had like a, a, a deformity or something, maybe, but we're not supposed to wear shoes. Our feet are designed to walk and feel the ground and splay. And we have three arches of our foot if we'll allow them to develop. But we wear shoes most of our lives. And a shoe is like a cast for our foot. We can't pronate properly. We squish the metatarsals together. We take the heel and we put it up on a drop in an unnatural position. None of these things make any sense. So we want to minimize how much we interfere with our foot. So that's why I like uh, Ultra, right? I don't work for them anymore, but let's see, Ultra, zero drop, Ultra, foot shape. Now it's still a cast for the foot, but at least it's zero drop and at least it's the shape of your foot. So you, we're doing, we're, we're taking away the biggest culprits here. But if you, if you take a medial post, which is what a stability shoe does, it takes like a more dense material and puts it right there. They're trying to keep you from pronating, but pronation is a good thing. You can actually go to YouTube, type in Haile Gebrselassie, greatest runner of all time, I think, pronation. Just type that in. I believe you can see videos of this on, on some of my videos. If you type in run elite pronation, you'll probably find this. Um, greatest runner of all time, in my opinion. He's certainly one of the top three. Um, on route to setting a world record, I believe at the London Marathon, on route to doing it at mile like 20 something, his pronation is sick. It's disgusting. It's like his medial malleolus, the bone in, inside of his ankle is like touching the ground almost. It's gross. And Every running store out there, most of them, most of them would put him in a stability shoe and they'd say, you over pronate, let's get you in a stability shoe. And uh, he wasn't injured. He set a world record in that race running 150, 160 miles per week, uninjured decade after decade after decade, went on to have another like 15 years in his career and break more world records. I don't think he needed a stability shoe. I'm loving my ultras. Awesome. Uh, me too. I only wear ultras now. I have a lifetime supply from working for them. I'll never run out. Uh, so that's all I wear, but it's all I want to wear. You speak the gospel. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I, uh, I've spent my life learning about running. Um, undergraduate school was uh, athletic training for distance runners. Um, graduate school was sports medicine, kinesiology, and biochemistry, uh, sorry, biomechanics for distance runners got into coaching, worked with Tony Robbins, certified in uh, Tony Robbins for mindset coaching. It's like, this is what I do. So thank you. I really appreciate the compliment. Uh, this is my life's work. Uh, all right. So we're going to take uh, one or two more and then got to go. Um, I have some shin splints on the right medial lower leg. Oh, you're going to love this. I can solve this for you. Not left though. Weird to me. Okay. Shin splints are caused. It's an overtraining injury caused by landing on your heel. So if you land on your forefoot, like this, if you land on your forefoot like that, the muscle that's on the front of your leg here that, that pulls your toes up, the tibialis anterior, that muscle, it doesn't need to contract. You land forefoot and this muscle here is not contracting. But if you land on your heel, you're not going to just slap your heel. You're going to control descend the toe a little bit. And when you do that, you're ripping and pulling on this tibialis anterior muscle here. Rip. So if you land on your heel, you're probably going to get, you're prone to getting shin splints. We'll put it that way. If you land midfoot, it's basically impossible to get shin splints, basically. So 
what I can tell you is I can tell you this. If you have shin splints, you're probably landing on your heel. And I can tell you if you're landing on your heel, you probably have a cadence that is less than 180 steps per minute. But the way to solve it is, uh, this is a big, I can't go into this here. We'd be here all night. But the way to solve it is to improve your power. And the way you do that is first improve your strength, then improve how quickly you can contract. Okay, so power exercises like um, like uh, jump rope, one-legged hops, skips, depth jumps, box jumps. If you do those over time, you'll improve your uh, shin splints. Um, and I do have a video on shin splints as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's on YouTube or if it's in my uh, private group only. Okay, I'll just read. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop with AJ's comment there. Um, anything else we'll, we'll talk next time. Uh, just got my first ultra two days ago. Yes. Love it. Go have fun with it. You're going to like it. I have severe plantar fasciitis for the past five years, eventually led to heel spurs. I used to be a heavy drinker. Um, any recommendations for plantar fasciitis? Yes. I have a plantar fasciitis course that is in beta testing right now. I have a couple of people in it. One of my, um, VIP clients, his name is, um, I don't know if I should put his full name here. Um, his name is David. I'll let him chime in in the comments later on if he wants with his last name. But he came to me with plantar fasciitis that he'd had for years and he had custom inserts and he couldn't walk uh, properly without pain. He went to the beach with his family. He couldn't walk on the beach. Pain, pain, pain. He couldn't run. We got him completely out of it in three weeks. Completely out of it in three weeks. Okay, completely. And uh, he's one of my case studies. I got a couple going on right now. Um, so I will have this for you. It'll be in about six months until then. Um, I can't coach you on it here. We're going to be here a long time, but I'll tell you the thing that you don't want to know that you probably don't want to hear, but it's the truth is that the biggest, the biggest thing you can do, there's there's two, I'll give you two, change your diet, fruits and vegetables. You'll heal, dare I say everything <laughs> like what, tell me what you wouldn't heal by giving your body proper input. Now you have to sleep as well, but if you eat properly, you're going to have superior health. If you're in chronic inflammation, let's give you a diet that combats inflammation. And you can, I have a couple of videos on this on spinach as well for decreasing inflammation on watercress. I have a video on that for decreasing inflammation. It doesn't matter. A plant, eat a plant, eat only plants and not foods that promote inflammation. And this will get better. But you can also do some um, physical therapy. So do this for me, please. Uh, if you have plantar fasciitis, go just type in Google, type in a soleus stretch. You've probably done a stretch before where you're stretching the gastroc, the, the gastrocnemius, the muscle on the back of your calf, this muscle here. But we also want to stretch the soleus, which is deep to that muscle, like deep inside and a little bit lower down. And instead of me showing you how to do it here, just Google how to stretch your soleus. Do that. Stretch both the gastroc and the soleus. Most people just stretch the gastroc. Add in the soleus stretch too. And if you do that, uh, you'll double the effectiveness of the stretch and you'll get better benefits. Now there's a, a hundred other things you can do. Okay. But those are the two most effective ones that I've found. Change your diet, do a soleus stretch. Um, I can give you a couple more too, but uh, come into Runny Lee, come join the group. Um, and I'll coach you on that one-on-one -on -one if you like. All right. So that's all we have time for here today. Uh, thanks for the knowledge drop. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I hope you got something awesome out of this. This was a fun training. We did actually more Q and A than we did on this, but this really opened up a whole can of worms, didn't it? We talked a lot about diet. Uh, thank you for being open minded. A lot of people are not, you just say the word apple to them and they call you a tyrant or something like that. It's like, that's kind of nuts to me. Um, but living proof here. If you want to learn the, the, like the best resource on distance running and eating a raw fruit based diet, go check this guy out. His, his name is Michael Arnstein inside of my book that comes out in two weeks. There is a case study on him and a chapter dedicated. Okay. But if you go to YouTube and you type in the fruitarian, he's got a whole channel. He hasn't posted there in like five or 10 years, but for a while he, look, this guy is a, is a monster of a runner. He ran 31 miles per day, every day. 
And then on the weekends, he'd run 50 miles on Saturday and 50 miles on Sunday. High mileage, never injured, winning big city marathons, winning big 100-mile races. He does it on 100% only fruit. Listen to him because um, the guy's a world of knowledge, okay? Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. World needs more opposing views to be more knowledgeable. Yep. I believe that you should be able to argue not just your side, but you should be able to argue the counter argument. If you don't know the counter arguments argument better than they do, you're pr you probably don't know your thing all that well either. So we need to know both sides. Um, I think that's true in anything that we really want to master. So uh, take care. I really hope you enjoyed this. We'll be doing this more. I like going live with y'all. Um, you can join our Facebook group too. And inside the Facebook group, we have bonuses. We do um, we do lots of other lives. There's 100 or 200 videos that I've done just in there. This is the first time I've ever gone live on YouTube actually as well. So um, we're going to end there. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great rest of your evening. And Andrew Snow from Run Elite signing out. See you next time.